never ceases to amaze me how God has people who knew nothing about what I was planning on preaching gives them a song that prepares for the message. It happens more than you will ever know. Just want to give you an update. Um, there was a medical emergency in my family last Friday. Uh, it was not life-threatening, but it was serious. And it was one of the Maybe the second time in my entire ministry I was not able to be at church when I was supposed to preach. So uh, thank you for bearing with me. Uh, to, to just bring you up to date, it's not life-threatening, it was serious, and there will be lingering issues. So many of you expressed a question, why couldn't I stay on? With what has taken place, I would be leaving anyway at this time. So just pray for us. We're, God's working, and it will be fine. Uh, also, I want to thank Pastor Mario. He called me earlier this week, Pastor Mario Perez, the new interim, and told me that he wanted me to give my farewell sermon after all, invited me back. I tried to say, no, it's not fair to you, and he said, it's not fair to you, and we bantered back and forth, arguing who it was more unfair towards, and obviously he won. So, and I am grateful for the opportunity to say, uh, give a farewell sermon and to say goodbye. Uh, thirdly, I want to thank Pastor Ben for filling in the pulpit last Sabbath on such short notes. Uh, he was willing to, and I was able to listen to, to most of it, and God blessed. And, and so, Pastor Ben, thank you so much for, for filling in. Um, I'm going to invite those who will be reading the scripture to come up and uh, be, get ready to read the scripture. I want it read just before I preach because I want it to be fresh in your minds. And so I will do my prayer on grace and, and mercy that I always do, and then they will read the scripture. Grace to you and peace from God, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever. Amen. At the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And then there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his garments white as snow. The soldiers shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. For he has risen, and he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Listen, I have told you. So they departed to tell his disciples. As they went to tell his disciples, suddenly Jesus met them, saying, Greetings. They came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. The Bible is filled with many stories. And often when we read the stories in the Bible, we focus on the Bible characters, their pluses and their minuses, their strengths and their weaknesses. We often focus on the problems and the challenges they face and what were the results of what took place in that story. And sometimes in doing that, we bypass some important details of what is said and why it's said, of reactions and and also of some failure to act. Today, I'm going to ask you to go with me and we're going to look at some of the details of the story of the resurrection. We're gonna, I'm gonna ask you and we're gonna to look together at the interaction between the angels and the women who came to anoint the body of Jesus. You may say and be wondering, why are you speaking about the resurrection? Easter is over. Um, I, I 
I agree with what Pastor Ben said last week. We need to focus on the resurrection more than just once a year. The resurrection is vitally important. It should have a daily impact on our lives. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul wrote that it was the resurrection that was proof of the divinity of Jesus. In fact, it was the resurrection and the preaching and proclaiming of the resurrection that created so much animosity and persecution in the early church, not the cross. In Romans chapter 6, Paul used the symbol of baptism as a reminder that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that can give us new life to transform and change us. And in Philippians chapter 3, Paul wrote that he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, not just in the future after he died, but he wanted to know the power of the resurrection in his own life. The resurrection is extremely vitally important to those of us who call ourselves disciples of Jesus. There is a saying, I'm sure you've heard it, that we need to kneel at the foot of the cross to seek forgiveness. I think it's equally important that we stand at the empty tomb to experience the power of God to transform us so that we can become more like Jesus. As I said a couple weeks ago, without the resurrection of Christ, the cross would be meaningless. And of course, without the cross, there would be no need for a resurrection. And so I'm going to ask that we go back and revisit the scripture that was just read, at least part of it. And I'm not going to read it in its entirety, but we're going to look at what the angels said and what took place afterwards. And we will discover that the angel gave three commands in Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 9, and one pronouncement. The three commands, one pronouncement. The first command is found in verse 5, do not be afraid. The pronouncement is given in verse 6. He is not here. He has risen. The second command is found in verse 6. Uh, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. The third command is found in verse 7. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen and he is going before you to Galilee. And then in the story, there are three results. Three results that took place because the women immediately obeyed the three commands. What were the results? Number one, it's found in verse 9. Jesus met them. They met with Jesus. The second result, they worshipped him. And the third result, while it's not told in Matthew, it is told in Luke. They did go and tell the disciples that Jesus was risen. They went and shared their experience with Jesus. We often just think those are just story details, but there's something more. A few weeks ago, as I was reading this passage and starting to prepare to give this sermon on this passage, I had an aha moment. I was looking at the first command, do not be afraid, fear not, And I knew the fact that that is not an uncommon statement in the Bible. In fact, someone has counted and said that it, and this is interesting, that that command to not be afraid in various ways is given 365 times. One for each day of the year. Leap year, I guess we miss one, we can repeat it. But that command, fear not, is given often. God gave it through Moses when the Israelites were standing on the brink of the Red Sea with mountains on either side and the Egyptian soldiers ready to to come and, and take them back to Egypt. And Moses told the Israelites, fear not. It was told to Joshua by an angel, by Moses, by God himself. Not once, not twice, but several times in the last two or three chapters of Deuteronomy in the first chapter of of Joshua. Joshua. Do not be afraid, be courageous, for I am with you wherever you go. 
It is spoken of in the Psalms over and over again, reminding us that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we shall not be afraid. And as I was thinking about those kind of situations, I was reminded of the story of the shepherds when the angel announced to them the birth of Jesus. And the first words from the angel were, do not be afraid. Fear not. I quickly got my Bible out and I went to Luke chapter 2 to, to see if there was anything more than just the word fear not. And I was totally surprised by the fact that there are very, very real similarities between what took place between the angel and the shepherds and what took place between the angel and the women. I do not believe that's a coincidence because the angels didn't just decide for themselves. I think I'll go down. No, there's no scripture for this. But I guarantee you, I would bet much money on this if I were a betting person, okay? The angels didn't decide to come down and say, this is the message I'm going to give them. This is the message for the shepherds. This is the message for the women. They are messengers of God, and God told them what to say to the shepherds and to the women. And they are very, very similar. I, I, so let's look at the first command. Let's look at the first command. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, in Matthew 28, verse 5. The angel said to the shepherds, fear not, in Luke 10, 10. Why were they afraid? In both instances, they were afraid because of the uncertainty, not knowing what's taking place. They were afraid because for the shepherds, there's light in the middle of the darkness and it's bright and they don't know what's happening. For the women at, at the tomb, they have come. They don't know what's happening because Jesus has died and they didn't think that would happen. And as they approach the tomb, they see the stone is rolled back and they don't know what's taking place. Fear often comes in a vacuum for all of us. When we are uncertain of what's taking place, when we think there might be consequences we don't know we can handle. But what is interesting is that fear often happens when there is divine intervention we can't explain. Remember the story of Jesus and the disciples when Jesus calmed the storm? Many of those disciples were seasoned fishermen. They knew how to handle boats. And the storm was so severe, they thought they were going to die. And they looked back at the back of the boat, and there was Jesus sound asleep. And they even rebuked him and said, Jesus, don't you even care that we're going to die? Do something. And then it says that Jesus calmed the storm. And the scripture is clear. They were more afraid because Jesus calmed the storm than they were because they thought they were going to die. Divine intervention brings a different kind of fear. But instead of a fear of despair is a fear of hope. Instead of a, a, a fear that, that creates doubt, it is a fear that creates faith. Instead of a fear that sends us into dismay, it is a fear that gives us assurance. And so the angel said to both women and to the shepherds, do not fear. Don't be afraid. God is here. But then came the pronouncement. To the woman, there was the pronouncement in verse 6. The Lord is not here. He has risen. He's not dead. He's alive. Your hopes aren't dashed. There's good news ahead. To the shepherds, he said, unto you this day a Savior is born in the city of Bethlehem. I want you to think about that pronouncement. They were life-changing pronouncements. A Savior is born. Jesus is risen. I want you to think about this. The announcement that a Savior is born was the... Was the implementation of the plan of salvation that had been brought and thought out through before the foundation of the world. And while in the Old Testament people were, were saved and experienced God's presence, but it was always because of what would take place 
through the life and the ministry and the death and resurrection of Jesus. And while we, living over 2,000 centuries later, experience God's mercy and grace, we only experience that because of the life and ministry and death and resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection was the consummation of God's plan to save a world in rebellion. Then there is the second command. To the women it was, come and see the place where he lay. To the shepherds it was, go find a baby lying in a manger. Do you see the parallels and the similarities? And I don't know about you, but as I look and we'll continue to look, these similarities and these parallels are strong parallels. Because God wants us to know that what took place was important. Without the birth of Jesus, there is no death and resurrection. Without the, the uh, resurrection, birth, the death and resurrection, his birth would have no meaning. They are tied together. Come and see the place where he lay. This was not just a command, it was also an invitation. It was an invitation to come see the evidence. Come and see that which God has proclaimed to you is not true. Come and experience for yourself the reality that God is at work to save you. It was an invitation to know God and to be known by God. And then there is the third command. Only it's only given to the women, at least in Scripture. Go quickly and tell my disciples that he is risen, that he's going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will meet him there. Now, I don't know for sure. I think it's very possible that the shepherds were told to go and tell others. They may not have been, but they understood because afterwards, after they went and saw Jesus, Scripture says that on their way back to the workplace, on the way back to the hills above Bethlehem where the sheep were, on their way back, it says that they told everyone everything that had happened to them. Do you notice? Do you notice the parallels? But what's interesting is what takes place after the angels had appeared to them, after the angels had gone back to heaven, or at least could not be seen. The parallels continue because we see results, the results of that encounter, those encounters. The first result is that they met with Jesus. They met with Jesus. Verse 9 says that the women met with Jesus. Actually, it was more like Jesus met with them. Um, Luke 2 tells us that they went and found Jesus in the manger. I, I want you to notice something very important about these two encounters. God was the initiator of them meeting with Jesus. Jesus. God was responsible for that taking place. God made it possible for them to be with Jesus. And, and, and I'd like you to think of what took place when they met with Jesus. For the women, can you imagine? They thought he was dead and gone. And now here he is standing before them in his resurrection body. And these were women who had followed him. Some of them had helped pay for his ministry. They had hoped he would be the Messiah to save them from the Romans and, and their hopes had been dashed on Friday. But Sunday morning, there the, he is standing with them. Do you think they may have had a few words to say about how good it was to see him? Do you think they may have had a few words to say about, Jesus, we're so glad you're alive. Jesus, tell us what it means. I think they are, may have even been somewhat speechless in spite of the fact that they had words to say. I think they'd be filled with joy and gratitude 
beyond description. Can you think about what it meant for the shepherds to be with Jesus, who would be the Savior? There is good evidence that these shepherds were the shepherds who watched over the flocks that were used for sacrifices in Jerusalem. Think about that for a second. Can you imagine what they experienced when they knelt there by the manger and saw that this was the promised Savior, the real sacrifice that was to to take place? Hadn't thought about this before this sermon, but again, reading between the lines, I admit it, I think it's very, very, very possible that when they knelt there and they told Mary and Joseph how the angel had appeared to them, and told them to come find Jesus, that Mary and Joseph told their stories about what the angels told them. That Joseph would have told them, listen, an angel appeared to me and told me not to be afraid to take Mary as as my wife, that that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. I, I imagine Mary would have told them, listen, let me tell you about the angel that appeared to me. It wasn't a dream like Joseph's, but there the angel was and told me that I had conceived and that which I had conceived was of the Holy Spirit and that we, he would be the Savior of the world. And I had never been with a man before. Can you imagine what that would do to those shepherds as they heard the witness of Mary and Joseph? And there they were and they met with Jesus at the beginning of his journey to the cross and his journey from the tomb. The second result, the second result was they worshiped Jesus. It tells us that after the angels left, the the women were hurrying to go tell the disciples like they had been commanded to, but they were stopped on the way because Jesus appeared, and after talking with Jesus and being with Jesus, they fell down on their knees and they worshiped him. We have a warped view of worship these days. Worship takes place only when we sing. That's not true. Singing is worship, but it's not the only place. We have a warped view of worship and then we think that worship is listening to a message from the Bible. And that as we listen to that message, that's worship. Worship is a verb. It includes action. I can't imagine the women standing there seeing Jesus alive, Jesus meeting with them, and they just stand there and say, okay, tell me a little bit more, please. Do you think that's how it happened? I think they worshiped him with their whole being, with their mind, with their body, with their feelings. Grateful. We are so stayed in our worship. Think about the shepherds. It says that they worshipped him. In fact, as they were leaving, it says that they glorified and praised God on their way. That was part of their testimony. Can't imagine them leaving there saying, yes, it's true, he was born. Yep, it happened. Let's go home. I imagine that uh, what happened that day went with them for weeks and months on end. Why is it that we reserve worship for one day out of seven? Just a question, just a thought. The third result was they shared their experience with others. They shared their experience with others. It says that the woman in Luke chapter 24, 10, that they told the disciples he was risen. And in Luke 2, it says that the shepherds told others what they had experienced as they were going back to their work. The news was too good not to share. Let me repeat that. The the news was too good not to share. Do you see the parallels in these two stories? It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. 
you may ask me, Pastor Gary, well, okay, but what does that mean? We, we get caught up in what does it mean as to who was there, to whom did they speak? What did it mean about what they said or what they did? What did it mean about where they were or when it happened? What did it mean? We ask the question, how is what happened to them relevant to you and to me today in the 21st century? How is that relevant? It's relevant in this way. Remember, in that society, women didn't have a very high standing. And that's putting it nicely. Women were literally almost like we used to say about children, to be seen and not heard in that society. People thank God that they weren't born women, remember? And God, the angel came and told women he's risen. Shepherds were the lowest of all classes of society. And yet angels came and told the shepherds, Unto you a Savior is born. As a pastor, I hear very frequently, all too frequently, people saying, I can't serve in a ministry. I don't have the talents or abilities. This story is relevant because the same angels who appeared to them are the same angels who will walk with you when you serve others. This story is relevant because it leaves us without an excuse for the fact that we too can be used by God to tell the story of what God has done in our lives and what he means to us. This story is relevant because it reminds us that God doesn't give his message by shouting it down from heaven. He gives his message by shouting it out through our transformed lives and our excitement about who God is and what he does. Let me ask the question, okay then, how do I apply this to my life? Besides the basic, vital, and essential message that he has risen, this story is applicable to you and me because I firmly believe with all my heart we are basically given the same message that demands a response from you and me too. We're basically given the same message. The same basic commands apply to you and me. And there is a broad pronouncement that has been given to us in this word about who God is and what God has done that we need to proclaim to others. I want to go back and I want to revisit the encounter of the angels with the women to show us how we can apply it to our lives. The first command from verse 5, fear not. Fear not. What is fear? There's an acronym for fear. The first letter of each the, a word for each letter that's there, fear, F-E-A-R. The acronym goes like this. False expectations appearing real. Fear is false expectations appearing real. We get so caught up in the what might be's, what ifs, that the uncertainties overcome us. And we stand shaking in fear when we are faced with challenges in our lives, physical, emotional, spiritual. Do not be afraid. Let me ask you a question, two questions. Are you afraid that you might not be saved? The angel says to you and me today, do not be afraid. Are you afraid you might fail in serving God and serving others? The angel says to you and me today, do not be afraid. Many years ago, 
A young man came to me in his late 20s, early 30s, all excited. Told me that he'd had an experience with God and he was so excited, his life was transformed, he wanted to serve God. Two weeks later, he came back and he said, Pastor Gary, I give up. I can't do it. God requires too much from me. And he walked out before I could say another word. I don't know what happened to him. Are you afraid that you might not be able to be the disciple God has called you to be? God, through his angel and through this word, says, fear not. Do not be afraid. The pronouncement unto you was born this day a Savior. On the cross, Jesus died to reconcile us to the Father. Through the reconciliation, he made it known that we are to live as sons and daughters of the King of the universe. The command to you this day, the pronouncement to you, is that Jesus is the Savior who is alive and can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think. You and I have an ongoing invitation to come and see Jesus. We have an ongoing invitation to go to the place where Jesus is, ascended into heaven, to the throne of grace, who intercedes for us, who prays for us, who pleads his blood for us. You have the invitation, the command, come and see. And we need to come and see Jesus every single day. Every single day. And then we have the same command that the women receive. Go quickly and tell others that Jesus wants to meet with them. It may not be Galilee. It may be in their home. It may be in a church. It may be while they're driving down the road. But we have had the same command to go and tell. And yet we are so reticent to do so. Let's admit it. Why are we so reticent? When it is the most wonderful, greatest news possible. That Jesus was born. That he died. That he rose again. That he ascended to heaven. The same Jesus who did all that. Is coming back. And we also have been invited to experience the same results. And I believe we can. If we follow those commands, we will have the same results. We will meet with Jesus. And he will meet with us through his spirit. We will worship in spirit and in truth, not just with our minds, having the right knowledge, not just with our feelings, having the right experience, and not just with our thoughts and our feelings, but also with our bodies because we will give ourselves to him completely. We will worship in spirit and truth. And perhaps we'll even hear more people talking about, I want to praise God for what happened to me this week than simply giving out a greeting that says, Happy Sabbath, and don't misunderstand me. I have a happy Sabbath, but I want to express more than just a happy Sabbath to people I want people to know that I am here to praise and worship the God who created, redeemed, and will come again for me. And he'll do that for you too. We have the same result can be ours. We can relate to others our own experience with God that changes and transforms us because, because of who he is and what he has done. Yes, we need to stand, we need to kneel before the cross on a regular basis to ask forgiveness for our sins. But we also need to stand before the empty tomb to experience the power of the resurrection that alone can transform our lives so that we might become more like Jesus. I think... think as we think about this story we can look at it as something that happened over 2,000 years ago 
or we can look at it as something that God wants to do in our lives today, in us and through us, to help prepare people for the good news that Jesus is coming back so that we, anyone who trusts and believes in him, can be with him forever. I'm going to close this sermon with a video song. It was recorded as a favor by a couple of friends of mine who happened to be cousins. I want you to listen to the words because the words of the song are really my prayer that the words of the song will be true and a reflection of who you are as a body of Christ, of who you are as a church, collectively and individually that this song will reflect the life and mission of the Laguna Niguel Seventh-day Adventist Church. <laughs> 